Under development. What explains the very uneven socioeconomic development of states in the world? There's a popular argument termed dependency, also neocolonialism, that persisting poverty in the developing world is the result of structurally unfair trade practices between the developed world and less industrialized states. An alternative explanation is that the developing world states have lower levels of per capita income due mostly to a failure to develop domestically. You can see here in red the different industrial regions of the world and the fact that most of the world industry is concentrated in the northern and the very uh, southern reaches of the southern hemisphere. But in the equatorial regions, there's a significant absence of industrial areas, despite the fact that most of the world pop world's population lives near the equator. This map displays differences in income levels, and you can see the lowest income levels are largely concentrated in Central Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, and then the lower middle income ranges are in areas like India and China and parts of South America. And then the upper middle income range, which today would apply to China, uh, is largely located in South America, Mexico, and parts of Eastern and Central Europe. And then the high income regions are Europe, North America, Japan, South Korea, and Australia. One of the important underlying factors of state wealth is the ease of agriculture and the fact that most of the fertile land which has high yields of cereals are located not near the equator and so you have very large levels of food production coming out of Europe and the United States. This map displays, again, with regard to the soil situation, the proportion of a country's caloric intake that is dependent on imports. And again, you're looking at Europe and North America, South America and Oceania as being the largest exporters. And countries like India are self-sufficient because of abundant arable land and the monsoons. But uh, India, Pakistan, and China are dependent to some extent on glacial waters uh, which are rapidly melting in the Himalayas. Uh, some of the regions of the world that are the most um, at risk for a lack of food autarky are uh, Africa and countries in the Middle East. Underdevelopment and the desire to become economically developed is the biggest policy focus for most developing countries in the Southern Hemisphere. The main grievance for the Southern states is with the Northern states. They suspect that there's some sort of dependency relationship, though the Northern Hemisphere states mostly point to the lack of rational development strategies in the countries that remain poor. So there's a frustration about the inability to close the income gap. At independence, with the decline of colon uh, colonialism, the newly independent states thought they would be able to rapidly develop economically and achieve uh, developmental levels uh, that are much closer to those of the developed states, but this didn't happen. Some states have developed, and of course, uh, the big, biggest example of a country that escaped poverty and was rapidly moving towards development was China, largely through uh, the creation of a bureaucracy that could invest in education and infrastructure. So there were adopted three strategies for development in the Southern Hemisphere. The first one was to de-link from the international economic system. And this was done by countries like uh, China and uh, India, which had very high uh, tariff barriers, 
And it made sense because it allowed the country to focus intensively on development. Uh, this, these were moderately successful. Uh, although China was not particularly wealthy per capita income in the 1980s, it had excellent education and infrastructure, which then set the stage for its capitalist development later on. So it's successful uh, if there is a domestic commitment to develop, if the institutions are there. Uh, number two, if there's a strong bureaucracy to halt corruption, which is one of the biggest problems for poor countries. Three, labor control. To ensure that the country is able to develop, it has to actually restrain unions from being able to obtain profits. Rather, profits are redirected by the state to other investments. So while the country is developing economically, the per capita income of the workers isn't necessarily increasing. Uh, and this could last for a generation. And four, a strong focus on education. Uh, this is what com communist China did until 1978 when Deng Xiaoping opened up China for uh, a selective business. You can see on the top right, Saddam Hussein in a girl's school. Saddam Hussein's regime received an honorific medal award from the United Nations for his advances in education, focusing on literacy. Saddam Hussein effectively uh, uh, forced the Iraqi population to become literate between 1975 and 1985, and he did it in a dramatic fashion and was recognized for it. Human capital development is key uh, in order to support uh, economic development of a country. A second strategy for development is to change the economic order itself. An example is the NIEO, the New International Economic Order, uh, which was established in the 1970s. These are largely unsuccessful. Uh, it's uh, simply not logical that small poor countries can change the economic system to redirect profit flows towards them. There's an exception, of course, which is OPEC, after the 1973 oil embargo, uh, the oil uh, uh, exporting countries renegotiated their contracts with the large Western corporations operating there and were able to increase their profits three, four, five fold, which had a large impact in increasing their revenue. Another successful manifestation of changing the economic order was the support for exclusive economic zones, EEZs, by many of the developing countries in the United Nations in their negotiation for the UNCLOS, the United Nations Law of the Sea Number 2, which gives countries 200 nautical miles exclusive economic control for things like fishing. So developing countries now could exclude other countries from fishing in their littoral areas. A third development strategy was to maximize the benefits from integration into the prevailing system. Uh, this is highly successful and it was done by states like Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, and Japan and is essentially the key to China's success and the growing success of India. However, it only works if the country has a well-developed bureaucracy. Uh, that is essentially free from um, corruption and there is labor discipline. In other words, the country's economic productivity is not being disrupted by uh, labor strikes. So there's labor discipline, for example, in Singapore, where it's very difficult for labor unions to organize strikes. Now, this doesn't imply that the country has to be centrally controlled. Uh, in Singapore, there's a great deal of state intervention and guidance to large corporations. In South Korea, there's a government investment on Kaibal, which are cartels that are owned by very powerful families that manage a large proportion of the economy. In Japan, you had MITI, which was a government agency which subsidized and provided uh, legal assistance to those businesses they wanted to succeed, and they discouraged assistance to those corporations they wanted to fail. So there was an actual accelerated selection process. In Hong Kong, 
uh, you had a very liberal system. You had a bureaucracy that was uh, protected from corruption, but did not get involved in economic development. And so Hong Kong uh, developed uh, in a very liberal environment. So you have a full spectrum from uh, strong state intervention to uh, uh, a liberal market. One of the manifestations of integration was the, the now defunct Lomé Convention between France and the states of Africa. So the states of Africa had export to the French market with uh, advantages that other exporters didn't have. And this was meant to give the African states a means of acquiring the export market necessary for development. Albert Hirschman did a study of Germany's trade with Eastern and Central Europe in the 1920s and 30s to reveal how dependence could be used for power politics. So there's two types of effects in foreign trade. The first is the supply effect. This is when a country is exporting strategic goods like oil uh, or uh, strategic minerals. This is often what we think of as power in trade. But Hirschman identifies a second type of power, which he calls the influence effect. This is when a country has a very powerful market, which other countries want access to, and it can deny them access to that market, thereby disrupting uh, their domestic economies and their domestic populations and having an electoral effect on their leaders. So the greater the benefits, the greater the dependency in a trading relationship. So in a bilateral trade relationship, you can increase prices, you can affect costly production methods, you can affect exports if you are the market. So what happened was Germany used the power of its market to influence the politics of countries in Eastern Europe. So Germany had relations, mostly in the form of agricultural trade, where Poland and Hungary would export to the German market and Czechoslovakia would export minerals and finished goods. And this is a policy that was uh, in some ways quite aggressive and was normal for Germany. In fact, the Weimar government practiced this. Now, Nazi Germany based its own free trade policy on the same program within the historical context of mercantilism, which is to use strategic use of trade to obtain greater relative gains, including influence. Its principal implication is that free trade is not free trade. Rather, it's the method of obtaining monopolization and therefore affecting the structure of trade so that states obtain favorable terms of exchange. So mercantilists are preoccupied with accumulating the necessary resources for war, which is what Nazi Germany did. Mercantilism explains why states do not rely on the free market, but engage in industrial policies to ensure that they retain a base of manufacturing strength. And so they seek to corner oil or uranium or phosphate production regions. So what Nazi Germany did was it opened up its market. It allowed states in Eastern Europe, particularly during the Depression, to get privileged access to the German market. And then Germany abruptly threatened to close its market to individual states. Uh, and, and allowed them to continue to trade if they changed their actual foreign policy and their politics, and then ultimately to uh, sell goods to the German market more cheaply. So Germany was threatening a shock to the domestic populations of these countries by abruptly cutting off trade at a time when these countries had few other choices for markets. When Nazi Germany inherited the Weimar Germany's economic control policies in Central and Eastern Europe, they then used that leverage to create political effects in those states. In effect, uh, uh, getting the Hungarians to provide through access for the German military, uh, getting the Romanians to uh, provide Germany uh, access to their oil fields, so there were political consequences uh, that were the result of Germany's economic influence. Now, contemporary dependency theory has its origins in the Economic Commission for Latin America in the late 1940s and one of the participants, Raoul Prebisch, 
who argued that the states of Latin America remained underdeveloped after the Second World War because of the essential disadvantages terms of trade in the international capitalist system. So they were arguing that there was an, an imperceptible structure driven by capitalism that made it difficult for states to escape underdevelopment. Now the historical context was Latin America provided a lot of resources uh, during the Second World War and they were effectively well paid for it and so the economies boomed during the conflict but when the war ended many of the resources that were in such high demand like food for example uh, corned beef from Argentina to England were no longer in demand and demand slumped and so did the economies of South America and uh, this explanation or rather the explanation for this uh, co persistent collapse into the 50s into the 60s um, was thought to be the result of dependency. But this leaves us with the methodological problem, which is how do you measure disadvantages terms of trade? Um, and some of this uh, underdevelopment fed into um, uh, populist politics. And you can see Juan Perón of Argentina on the uh, bottom right. Emmanuel Wallerstein proposed the world capitalist system. It's a Marxian theory in that it draws on Marxist mechanical concepts. Wallerstein argues that it's the world capitalist system that explains the uneven economic development of the world's states. The world capitalist system proposes that systemic maldistribution of resources occurs as a result of interstate relations, particularly between the developed and the developing worlds. This all began with the, with the collapse of feudalism. Given that the international system is based on anarchy, the absence of any overarching economic authority, this leads the modes of production to diffuse across national boundaries. The universal motive for all of the actors in the system is to maximize profits. The world capitalist system comprises three distinct state actors. States from the core areas, states from the peripheral areas, and states from the semi-peripheral areas. States from the core areas tend to have strong bureaucracies. They operate on behalf of capitalist landowners and merchant allies. Monarchs reinforced this mechanism to maximize their tax revenues. Constitutional compromises were often made that led to liberalism and democracy. The peripheral areas has capitalist landowners who want access to foreign markets in order to maximize their profit. They are often in conflict with the local commercial bourgeoisie who want to be protected from foreign capital. The precise success of a peripheral state and its configuration depends on local political coalitions. Core states often make use of military force and subversion to weaken peripheral states to get access to their markets. Semi-peripheral states keep the world capitalist system from polarizing and becoming politically unstable. Semi-peripheral states are typically peripheral states that were able to develop or core states who failed to keep up and fell back in their development. Wallerstein posits that there emerges an international economic division of labor consisting of a central core of powerful industrially advanced capitalist states. A periphery made up of weak states kept on a level of technological underdevelopment and subordinate to the status of provider of labor intensive raw materials for the core and a semi-periphery of states whose economic activities are a mixture in between those of the core and the periphery. Johann Galtung proposed a model in which you had an elite proletariat relationship in the core area, and you had an elite cheap labor force relationship in the peripheral areas and that the elite in the core area would take the profit from the elite in the peripheral areas and would use it to pay off the proletariat or the workers who are typically not the privileged in order to get them to continue to sustain the state. 
The capitalist system is based on exchange relations, not tribute, and it's not simply extractive. Protectionism or mercantilism is only ever practiced effectively by states one level behind the high point of strength in the system, in other words, other core states. Weak states are often unable to resist trade with powerful states. So when Holland was the leading trading state, the English were able to practice protectionism. When the United Kingdom was the leading commercial state, the French practiced protectionism. When the British were the leading state, the Germans practiced protectionism. And when the US was the leading commercial state, the Soviet Union and China engaged in protectionism. First, there's a qualitative change which occurs in the type. There occurred four stages of world capitalism. In stage one of agricultural capitalism began as a consequence of accidental technological and ecological conditions in Europe that led to the collapse of feudalism in the 14th and 15th centuries, in which Western Europe was the core, Eastern Europe and the New World the periphery, and the Mediterranean, like Venice, was the semi-periphery. After the final defeat of the Habsburgs in 1557, the system became nearly impossible to unbalance. Now, just to give you an illustration of how Venice, the Mediterranean, ended up being a semi-peripheral state, Venice used to be one of the most important financial centers in Europe. But with the rise of Western Europe, particularly the Portuguese and the Spanish expansion, uh, into the Atlantic and into the ocean, there began a stiff competition. The Portuguese sailor Albuquerque had taken over commerce in the Indian Ocean, and this had a huge negative effect on the finances of Venice, because Venice uh, would obtain uh, uh, profits from the resale of goods from the Silk Road that would pass from the East, including China, the Spice Islands in Indonesia, through India, and then through the Persian Gulf to Basra, and up the Red Sea to Egypt and to Alexandria. And these would then be sold on to Venice, and then Venice would sell them on to Europe. So Venice provided advisors and financing to the Ottoman fleet to seize control of the Indian Ocean back from the Portuguese. And there followed a 50-year campaign in which the Ottoman fleet went all the way to Diu in Gujarat, India, where allies of the Ottoman and the Venetians fought the Portuguese, but were defeated. And then the Portuguese uh, effectively blocked off trade in the Indian Ocean proper. And the battle then drifted to fighting in Abyssinia, Abyssinia what is today Ethiopia, with the Portuguese and their Abyssinian allies opposing uh, both uh, Muslim uh, areas and uh, other areas uh, in Africa. Uh, but ultimately it came to a standstill. And with Portugal then taking over the Spice Islands, the Moluccas in Indonesia, which provided a lot of the spice to Europe, they even dominated the source of the supply. And Venice went into rapid decline. So don't think of the semi-periphery as quietly going into decline. These states fought aggressively, um, but ultimately uh, capitalism advantages those states that master the technology. The second stage of capitalism emerged from a system-wide recession of 1650 to 1730 and resulted in a new mode of capitalism focused on mercantilism with its emphasis on the need for colonies. And this period was contested by the Dutch, the English, and the French. This is the uh, European uh, colonial conquests of 1810. The British hadn't conquered all of India. You still had the Maratha Empire. South America was mostly occupied, but not uh, southern Argentina. Here's 
European colonial possessions in 1914. Stage three, industrial capitalism saw the expansion of the world economy and the absorption of subsystems. Within this stage, changes in the mode of production eventually led to the obsolescence of slavery and semi-peripheral areas tended to engage in mercantilist type activity to, set, to offset the advantages of the core states. Another major consequence was that the proletariat achieved greater purchasing power. You can see here the impact of industrialization on uh, global output. Now England's rise from say 1800 to 1880 uh, basically increased it more than uh, twice where countries like China fell down to a third of their original productivity compared to the uh, European states. In stage four, there's the consolidation of industrial capitalism with a further change of the mode of production and the consequent erosion of colonialism. Here you can see the three main areas of decolonization, which are South Asia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa. There emerges two contradictions from the world capitalist system. The first concludes that to maintain a high level of production and associated consumption requires eventual redistribution of the previously withdrawn surplus. This accounts for the gradual expansion of the modes of production in the system and can lead to status changes in individual states or regions in their relationship to the core. The second contradiction states that as privileged factions co-opt resistance factions with a portion of the surplus, in effect creating democracy and economic redistribution, while there is a short-run elimination of opposition, in the long term the payoff expectations are increased in the subsequent crisis. So what satisfied workers in the 1920s did not satisfy workers in the 1970s who demanded a lot more action from the government and more redistribution of wealth. This can lead to the search for uncoopted labor from which the privilege can derive surplus. Uh, this is the uh, logic of the diffusion of technology. Uh, capitalism will therefore go abroad to build factories in places where the workers require less wages. And this is why you have deindustrialization in many of the developed states. Robert Gilpin elaborated three explanations and solutions of development. The first is liberal development. It has three assumptions. First, trade permits comparative advantage. Two, higher productivity encourages foreign direct investment. And three, foreign aid assists in funding projects. And you can see in the map below, targets of infrastructure development abroad in 2017. There are therefore three solutions to obtain this economic redistribution. Key is to remove market distortions. Number one, antitrust legislation to remove monopolies. A great many developing countries have these large inefficient corporations that don't focus on productivity, but simply act as locations where the relatives of the politicians get to work and get a good salary without having to put in too much effort. Number two, reduction of tariffs to encourage trade. Uh, very often local business interests will capture the political system and then push up high tariffs to protect their own industries and they end up producing goods that are heavily overpriced because they're not facing any competition. Number three, privatizing state enterprises to remove state distortions. A lot of the state-owned companies are very inefficient and having private companies compete against each other, uh, while it might provide less employment, uh, provides uh, greater productivity and benefits to the consumer. 
Now, there are three problems with liberal development. First, in some instances, there is no comparative advantage. For a country like Afghanistan, infrastructure and education is so low that the extremely low labor costs um, don't make up for it. And it's, it's cheaper to pay workers more who have higher levels of productivity in the neighboring states. This makes it very difficult for Afghanistan to develop the type of industry that can be exported. Two, state-managed export strategies are not a free market. Uh, very often, uh, you'll have states which manage their exports, like Japan or South Korea. And in, the, in these instances, it's not a liberal system at play. Three, trade depends on competitive worker productivity, which depends on education, health, security, anti-corruption, and infrastructure investments, which may not always be available. Gilpin's second approach to deal with underdevelopment is Marxist. So the Marxist assumption is that there's a world capitalist system which is structured in such a way as to preserve the state of economic affairs to the advantage of the major capitalist states. So the North-South South trade unfairly favors the developed states. One, the free flow of capital allows for the extraction of profits back to the investing states. So if a large U.S. oil company is operating in Nigeria, the profits they make after taxes, they bring back to wherever their headquarters is. Number two, monopolistic multinational corporations dominate trade structures. Uh, this uh, is, is what you would allege for the oil companies, for example. Number three, economic surplus expropriated through profits goes back to the investing state and it doesn't stay in the country where the economic activity is taking place. There are four problems with Marxist underdevelopment approaches. First, underdeveloped states simply don't matter in the bigger scheme of trade, except in the area of oil. Their productivity and their output is not significant enough to matter. Number two, developed states absorb most of their economic surplus successfully. Developed states don't need the developing world. Most of their investment doesn't go there. That is in fact the problem, not that the investment is going there and then bringing back profits, but that the investment's not going there to start with. Number three, investment of surplus in the developing world is of minor significance to the developed world. And number four, multinational industries are often overruled by foreign policy concerns. During the 1990s, uh, Bill Clinton wanted the U.S. to back U.S. oil companies in Central Asia as a way of bringing democracy to the region and bringing economic development and countering the influence of Russia and China. And the policy failed because the oil companies didn't want to go there. For a variety of reasons, they were extracting oil from different states and they didn't want to get involved in politics. The third approach to development is structuralist underdevelopment. Its assumptions are that trade on its own is not an engine of growth. International competition actually reduces export profits, especially when the competition is between states that produce the same primary good. The increased cost of manufactured goods makes it difficult to set up an industry. Export economies are actually isolated very often from each other. Investment avoids the underdeveloped states. So the structuralist solution to obtaining redistribution is threefold. One, ISI, import substitution industrialization. A state would diversify away from primary industries into manufacturing by using tariffs to protect infant industries. By raising tariffs, other countries can't export their cheaper products to the market, temporarily allowing very small and vulnerable industries to develop the technology to grow in scale. And once they are of sufficient size, then the tariffs are brought down and that company is able to trade into the market of other states. Number two, South-South trade and investment. The goal here is to reduce trade barriers between developing states to increase demand. 
And this can be done through regional integration. An example is Marcasur, which is the southern cone of Latin America. But in regions like ASEAN, Southeast Asia, regional integration wasn't that successful because the states almost all export nearly the same products, and so they're in direct competition with each other. Number three, population control. Reduce the population growth rate to avoid its depressing effects on per capita incomes. There can, of course, be long-term implications on the demographic balance of the population as a whole, which affected China, in that you have one child with two parents and four grandparents to support, and that is going to have a depressing effect on growth in the future. But if you examine differential um, fertility programs in, be, between Pakistan and Bang, Bangladesh, Bangladesh has been much more successful in its deliberate attempt to reduce the size of the family. And uh, that is why it's got about 25% less of a population than Pakistan, even though at uh, their start point of independence in 1971, uh, East Pakistan, what is today Bangladesh, had a larger population than West Pakistan. New dependency studies emerged in the 1970s and 1980s and were largely there to address paradoxes of development. There was a general dissatisfaction with Marxist dependency theories because of their inability to predict the rise of the East Asian industrial states, such as South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan. So there was a search for a better theory to explain development. Dependency was not able to demonstrate that there was an underlying structure in which profits were taken from these states and repatriated back to the core states. Another paradox of development is why, if the oil producing Middle Eastern states have so much oil, were they unable to leverage their cartel position as principal suppliers and why are they so uh, consistently domestically underdeveloped? Now part of the answer is the fact that they're a rentier state in the sense that they get easy wealth from oil and this undermines their focus on socioeconomic development of their own population. So the new dependency studies focused on domestic coalitions between different sectors of the capital community to explain which countries industrialized and which countries did not industrialize. Now O'Donnell proposed the bureaucratic authoritarian state model. And this is a state which seeks development and typically it's done with military backing, which is important because the military suppresses the organization of labor and it helps manage the coordination between the different sources of capital. These first emerged in the 1960s in response to the post Second World War economic crises. And examples would be Taiwan, uh, Pakistan of 1958, Korea in 1960, Brazil in 1964, all of these states successfully industrialized as a consequence of having a strong state actor intercede and coordinate the use of capital. These states also relied on ISI, Import Substitution Industrialization. Now industrialization goals required preparation and suppression of the population. On the one hand, the population needed to be educated but on the other hand, the government needed to delay the redistribution of the surplus to the population as higher income. Instead, that surplus was reinvested in infrastructure in the state. And only a generation or two later would there be a significant rise in per capita income. Now Evans and Cardoso, in their study of Brazil's modernization, proposed what they termed the associated dependent development model to explain how industrialization was achieved through an association of international capital, the bureaucratic authoritarian state as coordinator, and local capital. So here you had a state which set up the legal structures 
for corporations in which you'd had foreign capital and local capital working together. The local capital would bring most of the money. The foreign capital would bring the knowledge of technology. Now this was typically associated again with the suppression of the labor force to reduce the extraction of surplus capital. Now the association with international capital was important because Brazil lacked the technology. Now associated dependent development proceeds through three stages. One, the suppression of labor. Two, nationalist development replaced by an internationalized bourgeoisie. And finally, the economy restructures to international trade in stage three when it begins to export its goods.